The Arthur Schuller story has both a professional and personal perspective and divides into two distinct chapters. The first covers most of his life until he was in his 60s. He was born in 1874 in the town of Brno in Moravia as a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He later trained in Vienna where prior to World War II he built an international reputation as a pioneer in medical science. The second chapter starts in 1939 and is spent in exile with his wife in far distant Australia, in relative obscurity and diminished circumstances. In 1957, aged 83, he died, sad and depressed. His Austrian story parallels that of many successful Jewish families who benefited from the Habsburg Emperor Joseph II's 1782 edict granting them freedom to enter any profession. The trajectory of the rise and subsequent destruction of the Austrian Jewish community follows closely that of the rise and collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire from the mid-19th to the mid-20th century. Historically, some of Schuller's ancestors were purveyors of alcohol in Buczewice, a small town near Brno, where for generations they had lived in the Jewish ghetto and were buried in the local Jewish cemetery. In the early 1800s, the family ventured into using new textile weaving machines, and by 1850, various branches of the family had established textile factories in the outskirts of Brno. As they prospered, they moved into the more fashionable areas of Brno, which had become an important industrial, cultural and intellectual centre. While Arthur's uncles ran the family textile firms, his father Jonas was an ear, nose and throat doctor at 11 Johannesgasse, where Arthur was born on the 28th of December 1874. To judge from the apartment building into which his parents moved some time after his birth, Jonas's practice prospered. Arthur and his elder sister grew up looking over the main city square. Arthur was educated at the Brno German language gymnasium, where he excelled. And then, like so many bright young men of his generation, moved to the capital Vienna to study at the university. When in 1892 he enrolled in the prestigious Vienna Medical School, founded in 1365, it was already an international leader in medical science. Schuller graduated in 1899 with outstanding results. This earned him a ring from the Emperor and the accolade Sub Auspiciis Imperialis, which was only awarded to the very few students who achieved top marks in all their school and university exams. After completing a year as an intern at the internationally renowned Vienna General Hospital, Arthur spent six months working at the University of Berlin, where he was exposed to the latest research in physiology, neurology and neurosurgery, working with leading medical scientists. On his return to Vienna, Arthur worked for a year at the Vienna General Hospital with other eminent medical researchers, including Julius Wagner von Jaureg, whose work on cerebral syphilis, influenced by Schuller's knowledge of new X-ray techniques, earned him the Nobel Prize in 1927. After Röntgen had discovered X-rays in 1895, Vienna quickly established itself at the cutting edge of X-ray diagnostics. In the laboratory of leading radiologist Guido Holznecht, Schuller pioneered the application of X-rays for diagnosing and treating diseases of the brain. In the early 1900s, Schuller was made head of the psychiatric clinic in the Vienna Children's Hospital. In 1905, he published the book The Skull Base in Röntgen Pictures, Normal and Pathological Anatomy. It became the standard neuroradiology textbook of its time and is considered a milestone, marking the formal founding of neuroradiology. In recognition for his work, he received a four-page glowing reference from Wagner Jarek. 
In 1907, Schuller was appointed as a Privat Dozent, which meant that he could be paid for his postgraduate teaching, the fees from which he supplemented by privately teaching at home, where he kept his own X-ray machine. In 1910, he gave the name Chordotomy to a procedure for relief of syphilitic pain by operating on the spinal cord. And two years later, he published the first complete treatise on the radiology of the skull and brain, called Röntgen Diagnostics of Diseases of the Head. It was translated into English in 1918 and approved for publication by the US Army. Arthur was experimenting on dogs and monkeys and regularly publishing articles and giving demonstrations on his brain research. He used x-rays to study the diseased brains of children who were under his care at the psychiatric clinic. Although he did not perform the neurosurgery, his radiological expertise enabled him to map the brain accurately and to suggest surgical techniques for relieving pain and removing brain tumours. At this stage, Schuller was writing in German and only publishing in general medical journals. As a result, his pioneering radiological work had not yet been recognized by neurologists. However, in 1912, Spiller and Martin, two neurosurgeons in Philadelphia, wrote acknowledging the importance of Schuller's work in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Schuller is recognized for pioneering three surgical procedures and identifying three neurological diseases. He's generally acknowledged as the founder of the field of neuroradiology. In 1914, he was granted the title of adjunct professor, the youngest in the faculty at that time. His career reached its peak just before World War I, when Austria was making a massive contribution to cultural and intellectual life, producing, among many others, the psychoanalyst Freud, the artist Klimt, the philosopher Wittgenstein, and Mahler the musician. Arthur's private life also flourished, and in 1906, at the age of 32, he met and married Margareta Stiasny, daughter of a wealthy textile industrialist. Her Australian friend Margaret Rush recounts the Schuller's meeting as told to her by Margarete. And then she went on, she told me how she was introduced to the professor. There's 12 years difference in their ages. Her family came from Bruno and they were very wealthy obviously and had a box of the opera in Vienna. And she often spoke about going to the opera in Vienna. Um, and, they, and thought we were rather uncouth because we didn't appreciate opera and everything else. And she said that after the opera one night they went to the Sasha Hotel for supper and she and the professor were introduced to one another. Their two sons, Franz and Hans, were born in 1908 and 1909 respectively. The family moved into an apartment at Seven Garnison Gasse a short distance from Arthur's work at the university and the hospital. Friends describe the Schullers as modest and retiring rather than extravagant and sociable. They led a cultured life and both of them had a deep love of music. They were subscribers to the concert and opera series in Vienna and Arthur was a member of the renowned Vienna Medical Orchestra. They were moderately wealthy and owned a weekend house in Altenburg and a second house in Brno, which presumably earned them rental income. Members of his and his wife's family are shown in this celebratory photo taken on Arthur's 60th birthday in 1934. The fallout from World War I saw the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the establishment of the First Republic of Austria. At the Versailles Peace Conference, Arthur's cousin Richard negotiated the new boundaries of the Republic, which represented only a small fraction of the old empire's territory, population and resources. Now landlocked, 
Austria was cut off from its traditional sources of food and energy and suffered extensive deprivation. In the 1930s, the effects of the Wall Street financial crash spread to Europe and the Viennese Credit Anstalt Bank collapsed in 1931. Arthur's cousin committed suicide when his own bank failed. In 1933, Chancellor Dolphus suspended the parliament and governed as an Austro-Fascist dictator. Civil war erupted between conservatives and Marxists, and Dolphus was murdered by Nazi sympathizers. Schuschnigg, his successor, struggled to maintain Austria's independence until Germany invaded in March 1938. Arthur's personal and professional financial position had also been significantly impacted by the rampant post-war inflation. His medical school no longer had the resources to buy the latest radiological equipment or sufficient x-ray film for his work. Despite these deprivations, the medical school retained its reputation and Arthur was heavily involved in the international postgraduate medical teaching program which provided him with useful contacts outside Europe. He consolidated his reputation worldwide, giving papers in English, French and German to medical conferences in Argentina, Spain, the UK and the USA. He presented training courses in New York and Chicago and was invited to the famous Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. After Hitler annexed Austria in March 1938, Jews were no longer allowed to teach in universities. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 decreed a Jew to be anyone who had at least three grandparents who had been enrolled in a Jewish congregation. Despite being a practicing Catholic since he was baptized in 1908, Arthur Schuller and his family were designated Jewish. The head of the medical school, Eduard Pankopf, was a committed Nazi who expelled well over half the doctors and medical students. Arthur was now restricted to treating only Jewish patients, and this threat to his financial and professional future galvanized his search for a refuge country. He was invited to the USA by the eminent American neurosurgeon Walter Edward Dandy, but he was apprehensive about going due to the anti-Semitism emerging in the US. He told Dandy that he was considering Australia, in contrast, his cousin Hugo, a distinguished urologist who lived round the corner, did emigrate to New York. A government ruling in April 1938 required all Jews to list their domestic and foreign assets on a four-page form and on emigrating to pay a special tax and leave a substantial portion of their assets behind. The Schuller's asset list submitted in July 1938, highlights the two central elements of Arthur's life, his radiology and music. Represented by his listed collection of X-ray equipment and 4,000 X-ray plates, as well as a collection of musical instruments. He played his own violin and lent his other instruments to fellow musicians who came to play at his home. 9th of November 1938, Kristallnacht saw rampaging mobs destroying Jewish property and the situation for Jews was increasingly precarious. By January 1939, the Schullers had their Australian visas and on the 14th of April their German passports came through, allowing them to leave Vienna a few days later. While attending a congress in London, Arthur had been invited to Oxford by the Australian scientist Hugh Cairns. So, it was to spend three months in Oxford that the Schullers first fled. While there, he published another paper. He was also a central figure in the first International Congress of Neuroradiologists held in Antwerp in July 1939. The circumstances of his choice of Melbourne, Australia as his country of refuge have been documented in his biography, authored by Dr. Keith Henderson who was both a friend and medical colleague of Schuller's. Just months before his death in 2017, Dr. Henderson met with colleagues from St. Vincent's Hospital to recount memories of Schuller. 
people, the players in, in Shula coming to Australia are as follows. Um, Tony O'Sullivan, there was Cairns who told him to come to Oxford. There was Barclay, who was at the Nyfield Institute of Medical Research in Oxford. He approached Le Gros Clark, who's Professor of Anatomy at, in Oxford. Sidney Sunderland, the newly appointed Professor of Anatomy at the University of Melbourne, was with, still, still with Le Gros Clark, finishing off a research project. So there you've got four people, all Melbourne type, playing a strong influence on Shula. Now, Johnny O'Sullivan contact, contacted Morgan Morgan contacted the hospital and set it up, gave the nuns a, a focus of charitable intervention. Armed with that distinction, Arthur Schuller left Europe forever. Arthur and Margareta Schuller returned to England from the Antwerp Congress on the 29th of July, and in the first week of August left Croydon Airport on the newly established KLM flight to Australia. With 30 stops, it took over a week to reach Darwin for immigration clearance and then fly via Brisbane and Sydney to Melbourne. Arthur's reputation had preceded him and their arrival on August 11, 1939 was reported by a number of newspapers in Queensland, Melbourne and Sydney. Despite St Vincent's firm offer of employment, the Schullers still had to navigate Australia's restrictive immigration policy, which enforced stringent entry conditions. Their friend, Brisbane stockbroker Harold Netheim, facilitated their acceptance by agreeing to be the Schullers' Australian guarantor. They were also required to pay a landing fee and demonstrate that they had sufficient funds to support themselves. Their immigration papers list cheques totalling £2,500, equivalent to 250,000 Australian dollars today. He got to Melbourne and they installed him in the X-ray department there. He was welcomed by all the radiologists and so forth. They all got excited about him and they all invited him to give it a lecture. But the war blew up then and everybody lost sight of the, of the visiting professor. Indeed, he was officially not allowed to practice medicine or earn fees in Victoria. The Australian Medical Fraternity erected protectionist barriers to prevent non-British trained refugee doctors from practicing. And bizarrely, the Victoria State Medical Board did not recognize Viennese medical qualifications. However, in 1941, New South Wales did register him and he was also elected as an honorary member of the Australia-New Zealand Association of Radiologists. In 1942, the Commonwealth Health Department granted a licence as well. So, for his first seven years in Australia, Arthur was relegated to mentoring and advising his colleagues in both the radiology and the neurosurgical departments. He scrutinised and reported on every St Vincent's X-ray of the head, attended and commented on operations, and was able to take referrals, which he did in rooms lent to him at 20 Collins Street, the equivalent of prestigious Harley Street in London. Strictly speaking, he was not on St Vincent's books, but the nun's creative accounting provided a regular stipend. This was supplemented by a monthly remittance from Margarete's brother Alfred Stiasny, who had escaped earlier from Czechoslovakia with most of his considerable fortune. Early on, the Schullers had moved into rented accommodation in Punt Road, Praran, close to St Vincent's, which was Melbourne University's teaching hospital. In 1942, the university made Arthur an honorary research officer, and with it came his own office, which he visited once a week. He settled into a routine, always arriving at the hospital by 7.30, well before Morgan, the titular chief. In the early years, Arthur was a popular, accessible and much admired figure in the hospital, often eating lunch in the student cafeteria. 
he was recruited to play his violin at the annual Christmas concert. But as the war ended, they anxiously awaited for news of their family. In 1945, they heard from their nephew, Charles Stiasny, who was part of the liberating American army, reported that after suffering hardship and harassment in Brno and Prague, and in the camps at Theresienstadt and Auschwitz, both their sons, their granddaughter Eva, and Margarete's mother, had all perished at the hands of the Nazis. The news of their family's demise triggered a downward spiral in Arthur's physical and mental health. And bore unbelievable misery without a squeak, and my heart went out to him. Arthur's work had always been his mainstay, and despite his worsening depression and the onset of Parkinson's disease, he continued his research and diagnosing and treating patients. After he was finally given a license by the Victorian Medical Board in 1946, he started operating on public patients at Sacred Heart Hospital in the Melbourne suburb of Moorland and the Military Repatriation Hospital in Heidelberg. He continued working well into his late 70s, still publishing papers up until 1950. In 1947, he was elected as an honorary member of the Neurosurgical Society of Australasia. In 1949, he was invited to attend the first post-war international symposium Neuroradiologicum held in not Rotterdam. He declined to attend, but the paper he sent was given pride of place and he was elected as honorary president. Even as his attendance at the hospitals reduced, x-rays were still sent for him to assess at home. The curtains were always drawn or the blinds down. The home was dark, very quiet, and there was always classical music being played softly in the background. I would say her love of music and his love of music was so, so deep. And she used to tell me he played the violin, and she told me that he played the violin um, with Willy Boskowski. The Schuller's homeland, Austria, had also been devastated and occupied by the Russians till 1955 was at a nadir, thus ending any hope of returning to their former lives. They had previously renounced their Austrian citizenship and in 1944 sought Australian citizenship. Rather poignantly, the typed application forms include their two sons' names, but these are later marked omit in red pencil. In 1949, Schuller's medical colleagues, out of respect for his contribution and their increasing concern for his ever-deepening melancholy, put on a celebratory dinner for his 75th birthday at Melbourne's exclusive Athenaeum Club. In 1950, the Schullers bought a newly constructed house in Mortimer Street, Heidelberg. They were an integral part of the congregation at their local Catholic church, St. John's, where they regularly practiced their faith, which helped sustain them in their grief. Arthur Schuller continued to work at St. Vincent's into his early 80s, but his failing health meant he could no longer use public transport, so he relied on the generosity of his neighbour, Mr. Coombs, to chauffeur him. Arthur Coombs, the neighbour's son, recounts an amusing story of one of these journeys. On a number of occasions, uh, my father would pick Dr. Schuller up and take him into St. Vincent's Hospital I do remember Doctor shuffling up the uh, sideway and getting into the car with a great deal of difficulty because the seats were low. Going through Alfington, he opened up his uh, case and out with a human skull, much to my surprise, and then proceeded to uh, explain to my father the problem that person had had uh, near the ear. Now, my father's driving, of course, and finding it very difficult to concentrate on two things at once. 
Although Arthur was unable to enjoy the fruits of such a distinguished career, and his scientific activities were restricted, his contribution is now recognized by the annual Arthur Schuller Prize granted to young researchers by the Austrian Society of Neuroradiologists and by the selection of his story as the subject of the prestigious Max Neuberger Memorial Lecture on the History of Medicine given by Professor Butzi of Argentina in Vienna in February 2018. In 1957, at the age of 83, Schuller died of congestive heart failure in St. Vincent's Hospital, a sad and broken man. He was buried at their local cemetery in Heidelberg, and his death was reported on the ABC radio. Frank Morgan's funeral eulogy ended with these sentences. While Arthur could use his work as a refuge, and seek companionship from his colleagues, Margareta was left nursing a sick husband and then alone in outer suburban Melbourne without family and only a few friends. It is a credit to her resilience that she courageously decided to go out to work, offering herself to local families as a domestic help. She continued working into her 80s and became a fixture in some of these families especially the Austins and also at the Arthurs, where she would engage in relaxing conversation with the saddened, widowed father after cooking the family dinner. When she fell ill in the early 1970s, the Arthur family did her shopping and continued their financial and emotional support. Margareta gifted some of her family heirlooms to the Arthur children as wedding presents and the piano went to the Austins. She was part of the family in a way though. She was definitely part of the family. And she was quite unique, so the people once met her probably didn't forget her very much. She was we had an accent and this was Australia in nineteen the nineteen fifties. A widow for fifteen years, she died in St Vincent's Hospital in nineteen seventy two, aged eighty six. Apart from legacies to two nephews, to the local church, and to two individuals from Heidelberg, she left her whole estate, along with some personal effects, to the Sisters of Charity in gratitude for their assistance. It was worth almost $200,000, or some millions of today's dollars. The remittances from America had accumulated, and her parsimonious lifestyle meant that absolute financial hardship was probably not the prime motive for her seeking work, though anxiety about financial security may well have played a part. We hope that this condensed visual presentation and Keith Henderson's book will be memorials to Arthur and Margaret's lives, shattered by tragedy as their families were scattered across the globe or discarded anonymously in the ashes at Auschwitz. Another reminder of the waste of talent and destruction of human dignity caused by political power plays. <laughs>